Um, let's do this live session. Anyone got any questions? Okay, so I started Choose a Prey back in 2009, that's when we went live. Um, basically, I would started out, I'm a lawyer by trade, and I, actually, you know what, I'm going to start right from the beginning. I'm going to go even further back. <laughs> so, all throughout high school, I had studied really creative things, and to be honest, I thought I was going to be a ballet dancer. I auditioned to do that, and this thing kind of struck me as I was graduating high school, which was... I just didn't know, I would look at the newspaper, I would look at the news and I didn't really feel like I totally understood what was going on. And I came from a family where I was the first person to go to university, I felt really lucky to do that. Um, and my parents were incredibly supportive people. Um, I'm half Italian, half Australian, and my mum and dad used to talk to me about you know, how lucky I am to speak two languages and you know all the possibility that the world held uh, for someone who could speak two languages and had a uni degree. So I remember on the last day of high school, I was um, actually the last day of university preferences that were due. I remember sitting on my kitchen floor um, with a really close friend of mine, Fiona, <clears throat> and just saying to her, I don't know what to do. Uh, so I put down law and international business as my first preference. Uh, I chose Griffith University because it was the only university in Australia that had an actual degree in international business at the time. And I got in. And so I went in to study law and international business for a few years. I graduated and went to Blake Dawson Waldron, which is now Ashurst. And I worked there as a banking and finance lawyer for a few years. Um, and I liked it, but I just, it wasn't quite right for me. And I mean, the firm was amazing. The people I was working with were amazing. Um, and they, they just, you know, I started to interrogate people about their careers to try and understand uh, where they got to where they had gotten to. Um, and that's, and I put that side by side with a list of my life and things that I was really interested about and tried to marry that up with the things that I cared about. Um, I'm just going to pause the story there for a second because I can see a question coming in here. Uh, what sparked the idea for Shoes of Prey? You answered so many prayers. <laughs> thanks, thanks, <laughs> thanks, Christina. Um, so I, I'm kind of actually just about to get to that part. The thing was that um, through my career, you know, I was, I, I was um, at the same time, I always liked shoes but didn't necessarily love them. I just couldn't find exactly what I wanted. And I'd heard about this guy in Hong Kong who um, did custom made shoes. So I, <laughs> I had a stop over there when I was flying to London to go and see a girlfriend. And I was stopped over for about six hours and I went to see him and I walked into this like little shoe store and it just looked like a regular shoe store. And I said to the guy, oh, you know, is can I custom make a pair of shoes? And then all of these leather swatches came out and, you know, sketch pads and all this kind of stuff. In one and a half hours, I designed 14 pairs of shoes. 
and I had them shipped to Australia and when I got back and opened them up it was so exciting and all of my girlfriends were like oh my god where did these come from and when I explained to them you know one was like oh you know this is a pair of shoes that I had that I can't find anymore they don't make them another was you know I'm a size 10 wide foot find it hard to find great shoes can you make some for me and then side by side with me making shoes for my girlfriends, my two co-founders, Mike Knapp and Michael Fox, were both at Google at that point in time. I'm really excited about e-commerce and the potential that it had. They just needed an idea. So with that passion that they had um, and the idea of designing your own shoes, it became Design Your Own Shoes Online and Shoes of Prey. Um, the journey's been pretty incredible so far. So we launched in 2009. Um, and we broke even at two months, hit multi-million revenue in under two years. Uh, today we ship to about 100 different countries every single month. Um, we've had more than 6 million pairs of shoes designed on the website. We've raised around 35 million Australian dollars, largely out of the US. Uh, some of our investors include um, some firms that are extraordinary. Uh, Blue Sky out of Brisbane, uh, Blackbird is one of our very, very, very early investors um, out of the US, Coastal Nordstrom the department store, uh, Greycroft as well, and it's been a really exciting journey. Okay, there's another question here from Jennifer. Was it difficult to transition from small scale to big scale in terms of production processes, suppliers, and logistics? Yes. <laughs> oh my gosh, it was really difficult, particularly in our business because we're in the business of making one pair of shoes at a time. So it's not a system or a process that already existed um, with the su with supply chain that already was out there. So when we first started, uh, and we you know were doing a couple of pairs of shoes a day, <laughs> um, we were working with suppliers, and those suppliers were used to doing really big production orders, but um, were willing to kind of entertain our idea. And I think that that was a part of the way that we pitched the idea. Uh, and also because at that point in time, it was around when the global financial crisis had occurred. And I suspect that they were um, maybe had a few less orders around that time. So were willing to test something out with us. However, um, as we grew, um, our business really required a manufacturer to be able to grow with us. And um, a lot of this is a little bit of a hypothesis on my part, but um, we went to those suppliers and designed systems and processes uh, for them that we thought might work for producing one pair of shoes at a time at scale, which is very different to mass manufacturing one thing 10,000 times over. Um, and they weren't willing to, to do that. And I think, I, I suspect it's because the margins are all found in volume when you're in the manufacturing game. Uh, unless you're doing, unless when you're producing large numbers, that is. So I suspect that there would have been a bit of resilience and concern about investing in a new way of manufacturing that was based on one at a time. So we actually ended up having to open our own factory and design all of those systems and processes ourselves. Um, and to be really honest, I'm so glad that we did because I think that's a big part of why we're succeeding in mass customization where other companies might have um, either not succeeded or not or found it much more challenging because we really need control over being able to make one at a time at scale. Um, another question. Okay. Um, just going back through Samantha. Hi. Um, what is the question here? Sorry, just scrolling through. What is your biggest focus on the business at the moment? Oh, okay, so Samantha, we've got a bunch of um, focuses at the moment. I, I think that um, one of the things that's really interesting for me, we went through a rebrand towards the end of last year and as the creative director in the company, um, that's a really big thing to go through. And you, if you've been um, on our mailing list for a while or following Shoes of Prey for a while, you might have noticed a really big shift in our, um, our merchandising, our uh, branding, our imagery, um, and all of that sort of stuff and really coming together really neatly. So for me, there's definitely, we've always held our why in our hearts, but we've never really shared it as well as we can. And I, I think that, you know, for us, some of the big things that are super important is that we love our shoes, but the women who walk in them are amazing. And, um, you know, walking out that door every day, um, you know, we want to, when you're wearing the right shoes, it kind of puts a spring in your step. Um, and it's about expressing your identity through your shoes. And I, I truly believe that and live that every single day. So for me, that's a really big part of the, what we're doing at the moment. 
always a focus on manufacturing as well and getting those shoes made more quickly. We now deliver in guaranteed in two weeks, express in one week, which is a massive deal for something that we make for you when you put your order in. Um, but yeah, there's a, and also to making the design experience easier. So if anyone's been on the site and designed a pair of shoes or not gone through designing a pair of shoes, um, please do send me feedback. It's not something that we're always looking to crack and it's not something that has existed before. So we need to be continually researching it. Uh, Samantha, I might come back to your second question in a, in a minute. Uh, Melanie, thank you, that's so nice. Um, did you have a business mentor in the beginning to help guide you when you got the wobbles with confidence, etc.? cetera? Um, not an official business mentor, uh, but there are lots of people who I have had the opportunity to chat with along the way. Uh, and I was reading a book recently and it said something that has, is totally what happened on my journey, which is it's great to have mentors in people that have been there and done that, of course, but the people that you really learn a ton from are the people who are in the same boat as you at the same time, uh, because you're really experiencing the same things. So, um, you know, there's been a lot of women in that category uh, who have been extraordinary to chat to along the way. And just in terms of wobbles and in confidence, um, Melanie, that's so, so normal. Um, I still go through them today. In fact, I had a wobble today. Um, it's just a part of the journey of being an entrepreneur that doesn't get talked about enough. Uh, but if you're getting the wobbles, then good, because you're stepping outside of what is comfortable and you are exploring something important. And no matter how it ends up, this is such an incredible growth experience for you as a person, um, it was my belief anyway. So I hope you're okay and that those wobbles don't throw you off too far and you've got some good support around. Um, Daniela, hello from Shanghai. I love Shanghai. I'm very sad that no Noodle Bull closed. That was one of my favorite restaurants. Um, Antonia, hi. Um, was growth sales and revenue very steep from day one or was it more like a squiggly line? Antonia, we've had, um, we've had hockey sticks, we've had squiggly lines. And if you were to zoom out and look at the graph, the whole thing is a squiggly line that goes up and to the right. <laughs> so um, I think hockey sticks are a wonderful thing to chase, but I also think that it's a series of many, um, many decisions and tests and iterations over time. Uh, so don't be downheartened if you've got a squiggly line, as long as you're continually tracking up and to the right, you have something healthy. Um, I would also say that any business going up to the right is a healthy one, uh, generally speaking. Uh, there is a bit of a bias towards becoming a unicorn uh, and these wonderful things that get talked about in um, startup language. But uh, decide what kind of size and type of business that you want to be and chase the goals that make sense for your business and for what you're trying to build. Uh, Leah, oh my gosh, a fellow Lismore girl. Uh, <laughs> it's good to see you on here. Uh, Leah and I went to school together and I'm actually watching her business journey um, online. We are going to have to have, have a chat sometime soon. Andrea Culligan, another inspiration, an amazing woman. Um, it's nice to see you. <laughs> um, scrolling through comments here. Um, Andrea's just said I'm looking gorgeous. Do you know what? I saw your photos of Burning Man. You're looking gorgeous. Um, Kelly O'Connor, who doesn't love shoes? Very good question. Uh, Kimberly Taylor, what's shoes of praise? North Star. Um, we've been reading the same books. Um, it, it depends over time in the business. I think, to be really honest with you, um, I would say at the moment it's conversion rate. Um, conversion rates really interesting, particularly for us because we ask our customers to go on a very different journey. So the journey that we ask our customers to go on is not just to pull something off the shelf, but, um, to be involved in the process of creating their product. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a really interesting one for us and is a really good indication for us as to whether we're getting, uh, the design process right. Um, okay. How long after you started, did you start your own factory from Carly Victor? Uh, so we opened, we launched in 2009 and we opened our factory at the, on Christmas Eve in 2014. So it was about five years. So, um, could we have done it sooner? Potentially. Yes. Uh, it depends on, there are so many elements to work on in a business that it's, it can just be really hard to know when exactly the right time is. Uh, but yeah, it was five years for us. Uh, Jen Wilts, did you have to 
improve quality for US market? Do you find the US consumer more discerning in terms of quality expectations? Uh, the answer is no. Um, the quality, in terms of the quality, we continually work on our quality, but we didn't have to necessarily improve it specifically for the US market. The US consumer is um, not necessarily more discerning, but definitely have higher expectations around purchasing online uh, because it's a more seasoned market with that. So, um, and there's definitely kind of market standards that are absolutely expected. Um, I am tempted to say some of them are driven by Amazon, but um, I know that's a really hot topic here in the market right now. It's a good thing. Um, so yeah, there are really set expectations around return policies, um, how the packaging will be and <laughs> all of this kind of thing. So they're more um, seasoned, not necessarily more discerning. Okay. Kathy Wong, what was your best marketing channel, Jody? Uh, it depends on what metric we're looking at. Um, email is always incredibly solid. Um, uh, our digital advertising as well. Uh, so Facebook and um, usual Google stuff. But yeah, I, I guess email is probably the most consistent, strong. Uh, Samantha, um, not even going to try and pronounce your surname, Samantha. Um, thanks for taking the time. You're very welcome. How did you go about opening your own factory? Did you need to seek external funding upon startup? Also, what is your top tip for business marketing? That's a lot of questions. Okay. Um, how do we go about opening our own factory? Uh, we built a team, uh, out in China. We had, um, a person we knew come in as a consultant who, uh, Chris McCallum, who is now our COO um, and is based in China and runs our factory there. Um, I don't think we used any particular formula, to be really honest with you. We learned as much as we could. We started looking for space. We um, learned about the suppliers we wanted to work with. We started recruiting people to fill the roles that we didn't fully have our connections for. Um, our sourcing person, uh, Matt, our um, shoemaster, Ruben. Uh, we, so we brought some of that, that talent in. The initial stuff, though, was all hands-on learned by us. Um, part of the reason that it was more, we had to do more of the hands-on stuff ourselves is because the building of the factory had to be done to make one pair of shoes at a time and set up all of those systems and processes. Whereas, um, and I don't believe a whole factory has ever been set up like that before. So it was, it had to be an extremely hands-on process for us. Um, did you seek external funding upon startup? No, we bootstrapped. So we bootstrapped for two and a half years. And then our first round was $3.2 million uh, that we raised mostly here in Australia. Um, we, the reason we decided to raise was because we had a very defined idea that Shoes of Prey, we wanted to be this kind of global entity. Um, and we believe that the future of, uh, manner of um, retail is, you know, this on-demand manufacturing. We don't believe in, you know, making... 50,000 things, freighting them all around the world, creating a carbon footprint, hoping people will buy them, discounting, 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 and then what they're going to landfill. We believe in one at a time, it's a much better financial model for a business, but it's also way cooler for the environment. Um, and I believe that it really can work across so many categories. So um, we believed in that big idea, which is part of the reason we wanted to go faster. Um, and that's why we raised funding. Uh, what is your top tip for business marketing? Know your customer. Definitely know your customer inside out and back to front. Uh, Kelly, how would you recommend that startups keep their back office costs down through rapid growth? Oof, again, that's a really big question. Uh, it's a good one. Um, Kelly, I don't know if you would mind um, maybe giving me some specific areas that you're thinking about in more of the comments here. Um, there's certainly different things that you can outsource and plug in and all that kind of stuff. But um, yeah, why don't you give me a few, few more, a little bit more, drill down into that a little more for me in the comments and I'll see if I can answer it further down. Uh, Daniela, how, oops, sorry, I just scrolled past your, there we go. How many people purchase ready-made shoes versus designing pairs to purchase? Okay, so we don't have any ready-made shoes, even the ones you see in the gallery or in pictures. Um, if you order a pair, we will make them for you from scratch. Um, in terms of, even if someone clicks on a shoe in the gallery, normally it has a, they'll, they'll adjust something. They might just change the heel height a little bit, choose a different size or whatever. So they're always all made completely from scratch one at a time. Um, Samantha, 
the functionality in your site is incredible. Thank you. I'm going to tell my engineers and my UX, they're going to really love to have heard that from you. Thank you. Um, is that one of the most significant investments in your business? Enjoying your discussion? Oh, thanks. Um, look, it's definitely a big and important investment. I would say if I were to break down the business into three pillars, um, it would be you know, the marketing, the technology, and the manufacturing. And I would say that um, I guess it's, yeah, I mean, there are, there are three big investment areas, not just the technology, but we're constantly investing our time and resource in that area, of course, um, because nothing already exists. We're developing that whole platform. Uh, Kimberly again, hi. Um, would you sell the business? Your investors will probably skew this. And if yes, uh, what would be the trigger? Ah, that's such a tough question. Um, I know that I get advice for for people that you should know what your end game for your business is. Would you sell it? Would you IPO? Um, the answer is it depends. I think um, I would I would entertain a conversation or explore selling it for the right number and to the right person. Uh, so when I say to the right person, I mean a company that um, would sort of share our vision, of you know manufacturing on demand um, and beautiful shoes of course uh, an IPO could be interesting um, but yeah I, I don't know like I guess they're the two major routes but it, you know they'd, they'd be I would sell the business on the right terms um, I guess is the short answer <laughs> um, and Sonia realistically what ah okay now we're getting into the nitty-gritty stuff realistically what are your thoughts on husband wife startups how did you pull through emotionally with the separation while minimalizing the impact on the business can you tell us a bit about your journey I've gone through exactly the same thing but ended up stepping out of the business lady I'm sorry to hear that it's a tough 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 journey um, it's funny Michael and I were having this discussion the other day going I don't even remember being married you know it's just we I honestly think of him as one of my closest dearest friends I trust him implicitly we've absolutely got each other's back um, I know I mean going through the separation and divorce was really tough but we both always even when we were too, when we were married we kept it we never brought that into the business so to speak um, and we always kept everything very separate um, even today um, feel free to ping any of my staff to ask but the feedback that we get is that it's not it's a non-issue um, on a personal level of course it definitely had its challenges for both of us um, it's not a simple thing to deal with but the key um, the absolute absolute key is communicating and little niggles sharing them all um, and and work being being an open ear with each other not reading between the lines with each other sometimes when you've been in a or you are in a long relationship with someone, you tend to start reading between the lines and not listening. Um, and I think Michael and I have done a great job of you know, really listening to each other uh, over the course of all the tricky times and um, even right through to today. So that would be my, I guess, big share of my experience and learning on that. Um, that being said, I do think husband and wife businesses can absolutely work in startups. Uh, it wasn't what separated Michael and I. We had lots of other stuff happening, um, but um, I think I've been really lucky in, in that, that particular journey. Uh, Wella, uh, <laughs> and Antonio, if you want to ping me privately later, if there's stuff you want to talk about with that, please do. Uh, Wella, how did you overcome the challenges you faced in the early days when you're trying to market and sell your products? Oh, they're constantly marketing is a constant and trying to sell products is a constant 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 thing um, so to say became them I, I think you just sort of take bites out of them and remembering that your customer is constantly changing um, she's now on snapchat she's now <laughs> is she pinning anymore on what occasions is she pinning is she on Facebook versus Instagram uh, so I think that um, the the big ways to overcome them were having lots of data um, on your customer, uh, looking at where she is, um, and listening to people around the way that they talk about your product and listening to what sticks with them and then helping to either expand upon that, allay the concerns that they're expressing to you. So yeah, lots of listening to your customer and learning from them and then lots and lots of testing to figure out if any of that is, you know, to figure out what's actually sticking. So you probably heard this all before and I, I feel like I perhaps was a bit vague on that answer, my apologies. Uh, Yuki, theoretically, if you had only $1, would you spend it on marketing or tech? <laughs> 
Well, I guess theoretically, if I spend it on marketing, it, you know, we'd only spend it on marketing if we knew it was going to have an amazing ROI. A lot of that can be proven. So maybe I'd spend it on marketing and then invest the, um, the money I made from that in tech. And then I can have both. I don't know. Uh, Tina, hello. Uh, I've been following you on YouTube and Instagram. Love your motto, do everything before you're ready. Thank you. I just wanted to say hi, keen for more videos. They will come. Thank you so much. And I'm glad you like the motto. I have to think about it every morning. No joke. Uh, Daniela, AdWords versus Facebook or Insta for best conversion. Um, I think AdWords and Facebook, uh, Insta, not really explored fully just yet. Um, and I think that's coming towards the end of all the comments and questions there. Um, Kelly, I'm not sure if you want to add any more of those uh, kind of more deep dive questions on the back end of the business stuff. Um, but please do add them if you want me to dive into that a little bit more. Um, yeah, we've got four minutes left, ladies. Um, I don't want to call you guys bitches, even though I know that's what the group's called. So. <laughs> Oh, uh, you're welcome, Kimberly. I hope you guys are all looking forward to a good Friday night. It's pretty nice and warm. Ooh, Antonia, what has been the biggest challenge with the business to date? Uh, I think educating people. Um, because what we're doing is something completely different to you walk into a store, you grab something off the shelf and then you go. Uh, so explaining, helping them to go through the design process and really learning about how to um, make that accessible to people is the biggest, probably the biggest challenge in the business. Um, the manufacturing has been a huge challenge as well, of course, of course as the tech, but um, that cracking that paradigm shift is probably the biggest one. Uh, Denise, hello. Uh, where did you get your customer data? Focus groups, customer surveys. I know my customer personas, but where did you get specific info? Um, so yes, we do focus groups. There's also a great book um, called Buyer Personas by Adele Rivella. I hope I said that right. Um, I read that and I used that to form the basis of doing customer phone calls on a regular basis. Um, and it I divide those customers into specific areas. So people who are repeat customers, people who have bought once and never again, people who have um, subscribed to our email list but never bought, maybe they've designed some shoes but never purchased. And then lastly, people who haven't even heard about us. And I ask them only one question, and that is, um, tell me about the last time you bought a pair of shoes. And then I just could have interview them uh, like a journalist and drill right down into learning about that. That has been an amazing source of insights. Um, the focus groups, yes. Sending out surveys, yes. Um, and also going to the market for data as well on women's shoes and breaking that down into your geographies has been really helpful. Uh, okay, what else have we got here? Um, are you a member of any family business organizations? Uh, no, I'm not Emily. Um, I, yeah, I, I, I'm not. <laughs> Kimberly, what's the key to growing a team from 10 to where you are now? So we're now 220 people. Um, I think that uh, having great systems and processes for people is really important. Uh, it, in terms of systems and processes around them being able to do their job and having the right tools, um, also having good HR systems and processes and massive shout out to a woman in our business named Anna Henderson, which who, who has really um, been phenomenal in implementing this with us just so that people know that they're valued, they understand what the next steps in their career could be um, with the company um, and are connected into a really good information flow within the company. Um, culture is super important. We documented our culture and got our first culture code out probably two years in. And that is, that is an ongoing process that we review with the whole team every year. And I can't express how important that has been to keeping us true to the environment that we want to build and getting the work done that we believe in. Uh, Jennifer, thanks for your time. You're very welcome. Thank you for having me. It's so flattering to be invited. Uh, Antonia, you're very welcome. I'm not a star. You're a star. Uh, Samantha, returns. Good question. What percentage of first-time customers result in returns, chose the wrong size, or didn't meet their expectations? Okay, so traditionally we don't disclose our return rate. Um, it is far below industry average though, which is good news. Um, the biggest reason for returns though is sizing. Uh, so, and, I, and that's shared with industry as well. 
We do allow returns for any reason whatsoever, but we do ask that you tell us what the reason is so we can collect data and do things like it might reveal that a certain shoe has an issue in terms of the way that it's fitting or a leather that might be biting or something like that so we can change it. P.S. our leathers don't bite. I, that was a poor turn of phrase from me. Um, but yeah, re returns are tricky uh, just because like figuring out what to do with them. We uh, donate some to charity. We do have friends and family sales. Um, in fact, if you sign up to the Good360 newsletter, uh, they're a charity through which we, um, you can pick up uh, some of our shoes there. Um, and we also put some into our press kits and things like that. Uh, Kathy, um, thank you for your lovely comment there. Um, are there any plans for other products? Always keep your eye on Shoes of Prey for Monday. There is a really big launch happening and um, I don't even have a pair yet, which is really upsetting, but I will be ordering my pair when these launch next week. So keep your eyes peeled. Uh, Jen, what are your favorite behind the scenes business tech products? Uh, so many Slack. Um, is amazing, <laughs> of course. Um, it's because we have offices in China, Manila, um, and the US. Uh, I'm constantly in God knows what time zone. Uh, so that has been really critical for us having good cross-functional communication with projects that are in, um, project with people who are in different places. Um, Zero uh, makes life easier, particularly for smaller businesses. We've, we've just had to move on. We've just outgrown it, but um, it took us a long, long way, which is amazing. Um, Look, there's so much sitting in our startup stack. It's crazy. Uh, Contentful is another one for anyone out there um, who is a developer. Um, I could go on and on about that one. If you have any specific um, areas that you're um, thinking about in your tech stack that uh, you haven't stacked yet, Jen, uh, please comment and I will tell you what I am using for it if I know. Um, that's a funny thing, actually, as the company grows, just um, there are things that I don't know <laughs> now, uh, and I like to know everything, so I guess I have to get comfortable with that. Okay, we are at 5.32, and it's really strange to sit in front of a computer and just talk to yourself, so I'm going to go. <laughs> but um, I just, I'm so inspired by this community. Uh, you're an amazing group of women, and it's really cool to watch what's happening on the page here. Um, great questions, and looking forward to seeing you ladies post and find out more about your journeys and what you get up to. So um, do everything before you're ready, especially wear good shoes. And I hope you ladies have a wonderful weekend. Bye.